Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. And of course, Happy New Year. America lasted yet another 12 months as the best country in the world, but it was a turbulent year. And 2018 could be even more so. So later tonight, advice on how to thrive over the year ahead, no matter what happens. But first, this country's largest state has taken another dramatic step toward disunion and open defiance of the federal government. As of yesterday, California is now a sanctuary state. It's the nation's first. All police statewide in California are banned from asking about a suspect's immigration status or cooperating with federal immigration officials. Landlords are banned from reporting the legal status of their tenants. Colleges can't monitor the immigration status of the kids they enroll. These new measures augment the state's many existing laws, all designed to enable illegal immigration. Illegals in California already are entitled to receive a driver's license, in-state college tuition, free health care for their children, and more. They don't need to have a job. They don't have to know English. It doesn't matter even if they have a history of crime, even violent crime. In California, illegal aliens are now a protected class. And maybe more significant, the state itself is now in direct opposition to this country's most basic laws. 55 years ago this month, Governor George Wallace took his oath of office and pledged resistance to federal authority, effectively declaring Alabama its own country. You know the history. Well, Governor Jerry Brown of California has done something similar this week. Travis Allen is a Republican in the California State Assembly, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Allen, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, Tucker. So California is the biggest state, but it's still a state, not a country. How can it have its own immigration policy? How can it redefine citizenship when it's not a country? Simply put, it can't. This whole sanctuary state is entirely illegal, and we're actually welcoming Trump and Sessions to come out to California and uh, take them to court. But how does this end? I mean, when, when states de declare publicly we're not following the laws of the country, we're making our own laws, and there's nothing you can do about it, I mean, that sounds like the beginning of a schism, a split, a war. Without a doubt. I mean, California truly has become the center of the quote-unquote resistance to the president and everything that seems to make common sense in the United States. So with Jerry Brown's recent action of the sanctuary state, Californians don't even agree with this. But the politicians that are running the state in Sacramento, keep in mind the legislature up until just recently was two-thirds Democrat, and all of the statewide officers are Democrat as well, passed this law, even though Californians are absolutely against it. What's so striking in the specific case of California is that the state is hemorrhaging its middle class. They're moving to neighboring states, north and east, in huge numbers. And it's been written about a lot. The state doesn't seem to care and even as this happens, seems to be importing a lot of new, much poorer, less educated people. What's the thinking there? You know, I, I really don't know that there is a thinking there. Uh, you know, a lot of Sacramento and San Francisco exists really in its own bubble. The numbers came out just recently. 243,000 Californians have left in just the last few years, taking about $8 billion with them. And in their place, of course, now we have this burgeoning illegal population, which now, as you mentioned, has protected class status. And it gets very bad because, you see, this is California taxpayer dollars being used to shelter criminals who are committing crimes while they're here. And these aren't, these aren't small crimes. We're talking assault on a police officer, domestic battery, animal cruelty, possession of concealed weapons, biological uh, agents. I mean, these are real crimes, and yet Jerry Brown and the California Democrats want to essentially ignore federal immigration law and protect these people at California's expense. And that's just wrong. But ignoring immigration law is not the same as ignoring other kinds of law because it gets to the deepest question about any country, which is who's a citizen and who's not, who deserves to be here, who doesn't, what are borders. And so California can't, your governor can't expect this to go ignored. You can't just decide you're not going to enforce the borders and expect Washington to do nothing. Is there a showdown coming? Absolutely there is. I mean, this is truly, it, it's, it's a bluff. And it's up to the president and Jeff Sessions to step in and call the bluff of Jerry Brown and all the California Democrats that are passing these unconstitutional laws. And, and keep in mind too, you know, a lot of people around the country say, well, you know, everybody in California is liberal, they're Democrat, and that, there could be nothing further from the truth. There's actually more Republicans here in California than in any other state. And, and past that, forget about party lines for a moment. 74% of Californians are absolutely against sanctuary state, including 65% of Latinos. 
Well, why would they be for it? I mean, people aren't, the middle class isn't leaving California because it's thriving. The infrastructure is a mess. The schools are terrible. There's more poverty in the state than any mm -hmm. state in the union. I, I mean, is there a connection, do you think, between the state's immigration policies and the direction of its economy? Without a doubt. And, and, I mean, really, you have to go back a couple of decades. The California legislature has been dominated by Democrats by 39 of the last 40 years. Yeah. The Brown family has run California for 24 of essentially the last 50 years. So you need to look no further than, than what has been going on successfully. We had driver's licenses for undocumented uh, immigrants, people who are here illegally. And now this is really just the next step. Now it's a sanctuary state. All of these things are unconstitutional, but the California legal system is broken. The California political system is broken. That's why we truly need Washington to hear this message and come to California, sue California, take them to Supreme Court, and let's get the Constitution enforced because there's a lot of Californians here that want to be protected. Until we get a new governor in the state, you know I'm running to be the next governor of California. Until that happens, we could actually use some help from the national guys. Well, and it affects the rest of us too. Uh, Assemblyman Allen, thank you very much for joining us. Without a doubt, Tucker, remember, what starts here in California usually spreads to the rest of the nation, so let's put a stop to it. Like a virus. Thanks. Kathy Aru is the founding publisher of Catalina Magazine, and she joins us tonight. Kathy, thanks for coming on. So okay. you, you can agree or not with the new policy in California, but doesn't it give you pause that California is basically doing what southern states did 50 years ago, 60 years ago, in saying, we're ignoring federal authority on, on states' rights grounds. We're not going to acknowledge that your law is valid. Liberals used to be against that. They're no, not anymore. It's quite the opposite. I mean, they're allowing the federal government to do what it's supposed to do. The state and local governments are not supposed to handle immigration and ask people for their papers. So if anything, they're giving the authority back to the federal government, not taking it into their own hands. No, because there are many specific cases where the state of California, as a matter of policy, has refused to hand over, and this law codifies it, criminals to the federal government. They are refusing to cooperate with federal law. They're saying, we're not, we don't acknowledge that law is valid. And that, how is that different from what George Wallace said? No, it's not like that at all. And as a matter of fact, this is not the first state to become a sanctuary state. Oregon well, is. is a sanctuary. Oregon is a sanctuary state, and Oregon is one of the safest states in our union. And sanctuary states and sanctuary cities are some of the safest places to be in the United States. That's simply not this, true. Yes, it is. Well, they're South actually, Carolina yeah, they're, is one of the this has actually states. been studied uh, at, at at some length. Right. Let me ask you. Let me okay. ask you though. California is not one of the safest places. Its cities, uh, in many cases, are a mess. But its economy is in tough shape, and there's more poverty in that state and more homeless people in that state than any other state. And California doesn't house. 67% of all the homeless in California have no shelter. Why the emphasis on coddling people from another country when California's own citizens and residents are suffering in huge numbers? Well, these people from another country aren't exactly hurting the system in any single way. They wouldn't be here if the work and the jobs were not here. So these people are not hurting our system. Uh, oh, really? Because right. there are 135,000 homeless people in the state of California. The overwhelming and, and majority a, have... We're hold blaming on, immigrants? Have, have, hold on. Have no jobs. Right. have no homes, okay. are living outside the overwhelming majority of them, and yet somehow there's a need for more low-wage labor in the state? The, Why shouldn't the state be attending to their needs before the needs of people who snuck in illegally from another country? Well, they're not. They're not coddling. They're not helping the, these immigrants in any way. These immigrants are here. You and they're, they're giving they're them driver's license. Well, slow down. They're giving them driver's license. They're paying for schools. They're paying for health care, infrastructure. And immigrants then they're saying pay the taxes. Feds, immigrants no, pay taxes. No, they actually, do. hold on. Yeah. Every illegal immigrant working in this country is using fake federal documents illegally. That's a felony, by the way. You fake yes. documents. They're not all paying taxes. You know that that's not true. But the point yeah, is, sure why should the state attend to their needs when you've got more homeless people living in California than live in the entire city of Dayton, Ohio? That's a lot of people. Immigrants are paying them? millions of dollars in taxes. They are helping the state, and they wouldn't be there if there wasn't work. So if there's anyone's problem, are the corporations that are hiring these immigrants. But what about the, what about the, hold on, but what about the, the Californians who were born there, right. or who are naturalized Americans, who were born somewhere else but came here legally, right. who don't have work, who are, again, living outside 
Why isn't their plight priority number one? Why is it that of the illegal alien? Why well, is that the, person's plight more important? Who's to say their plight isn't number one? The undocumented person's plight isn't number one. It's simply being a sanctuary state means that they're not going to take the time from these people who will call in oh. a crime, that they're not going to... Um, tell these people you're not wanted here, you're not, not working, you're not being productive, you're not helping our society. They're just saying, be part of our community. Call in oh. the crimes, so, so join why, our community, I, I, feel I safe why here. Wait, hold on. Why yeah. didn't the governor just sign a law mm -hmm. designed to help the more than 100,000 people living outside in California, the American citizens, living outside, dying outside? Why didn't he sign a law helping them? Well, he's helping everyone by making these people feel welcome in his state. He's helping everyone. But everyone how does it help? Him, hold on. Well, how does it help Americans or Californians in this case without jobs to uh, welcome uh, people it, uh, to uh, work for less than they would make? Undocumented, how does that help undocumented immigrants are not hurting anyone's jobs. They're not taking away anyone's jobs. As a matter of fact, we need more worker visas for these people. We just don't have a system that but allows the, year-round worker we visas. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really trying to. I'm trying to be patient. I'm trying to track with you logically. Of course. How is it that when you have a huge pool of people who are unemployed, mm -hmm. it's helpful to those people, the American unemployed, to bring in a whole lot of other people? And give them jobs. How does well, that help the unemployed in America? I'm well, we totally know that baffled. What, what, what's hurting is that technology and the manufacturing jobs are gone, and technology is what's hurting workers in America. It's not the undocumented immigrant. Okay, so if technology is making all the low-wage jobs going away, go away, then why are we letting in hundreds of thousands, nationally millions of people with no skills, tech skills at all? Uh, well, well, we have immigration is at an all-time low. So uh, immigration right now. It's not at right an all-time low. That's it, it a made-up statistic. It is. It's not a made-up statistic. It's actually, was, no, it was actually bigger but, in the 70s. Okay. But so just, it is just lower to, right now than ever. That's not true, actually. Yes, I know is. the numbers. But let's just in one sentence. Yeah. If technology is making it harder for people who don't have advanced tech skills right. to find work, right? Why in the world are our politicians letting in millions of people with no tech skills at all? Well, because they're probably needed. They're needed. There are. But you just said they weren't going to be needed because they're going to be displaced by technology. Well, right now they are needed. These workers are needed year round, and we need visas for these type of workers, and we this need for really them to sick. feel comfortable in our country. Okay, thank you, Kathy. I appreciate it. Thank. You. Steve Cortez worked on Donald Trump's presidential campaign on the Hispanic Advisory Council, and he joins us tonight. Th thanks a lot for coming on tonight. I, pr I appreciate it. So uh, you, know, you sort of Thank you. press a little bit on the economic rationale for this, and I, I, no one's attacking immigrants. I'm certainly not. But you've got to right. kind of wonder about the motive. If you have someone arguing simultaneously that technology is making low-wage jobs disappear, and that's true, and at the same time, arguing we need millions more low-wage workers right. in this country. What is the actual motive here? Right. No, you can't have it both ways, Tucker. You, and, and you're exactly right. And by the way, I say this as an Hispanic and as an immigrant son. Uh, no one suffers more from illegal immigration than Hispanic Americans, uh, whether they be native-born or legal immigrants. Well, and legal sure. immigrants go through a difficult, long process to become American citizens. So they are the most cheated when we allow and tolerate illegal immigration. But to your point, too, of you know, what's the motive here? Why does the left want so many illegal immigrants? Why do they want amnesty? Let's just be honest about it, Tucker. They want their votes. They yeah. think the more amnesty they grant, the more votes they will get. They're having a hard time in America. They've been in systemic decline, particularly in the state houses of American elections. And they think one way to reverse that is millions of new workers, millions of new who will flood the workforce. Uh, and as you said, create an unnaturally low wage to compete with American workers, many of them Hispanic. Uh, they don't care about that. But they will also get millions of new votes. So it is a crass political calculus which they've engaged in and which they're pursuing. And let's be honest about it. See, I don't want to believe that because it's an inversion of the duty of government, which is to look out for its own people, its own citizens. And here you have a state, California, where the middle class is literally running away and enriching all right. the neighbor, neighboring states and being replaced by poor people with no skills who aren't even here legally. That seems like the opposite of what the government should be doing to its own people. Well, Tucker, of course it is, which is why, by the way, we need, listen, 
I love immigration. I'm not anti-immigrant. Far from it. It's why we need to move to merit-based immigration. Chain migration has been a disaster for this country. Exactly. It's a disaster for our economic security, for our national security. The visa lottery system is an insanity that has to be ended yesterday. We need to move to an immigration system that makes sense for America. People who bring drive and skills and who love our country and love our values. But That's where we were historically and where we need to be again. But without chain migration, California would be the California that voted for Ronald Reagan twice. I mean, it's had massive right. political upside for the Democratic Party. No, and again, I think that's the crass calculus that the Democratic Party is engaged in. And, and you know what, too? Your earlier guess is right. We should take heed here because often what happens in California, whether it's fashion or television yeah, no. or politics, what happens there does uh, bleed into the rest of the country. And we should take notice. Do we want to become California, which right now is in many ways a third world place? It's a place yeah. of incredibly rich elites. And then exactly. incredibly impoverished, dependent underclass. That's what the Democratic Party wants to create through mass migration, through chain migration, through illegal immigration. That's not the America that we want to live in. It's not the America that Hispanic no, Americans want to live totally in. totally right. And if you're in Santa Barbara or Pacific Heights, you don't even see it, but it's there. Steve, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Thank you. Donald Trump was mocked, attacked, really, for saying the Obama administration spied on him. But nine months later, reassessed that statement. Was he right? Plus, after a 2017 where the country nearly tore itself apart, we've got suggestions for surviving this new year. Coming up. Nine months ago, President Trump sent out a tweet that shocked a lot of people. Here's what it said. Terrible, exclamation point. I just found out that Obama had my wires tapped in Trump Tower just before the victory. Nothing found. This is McCarthyism. Now, the press jumped on that tweet. The claim was ridiculed, to put it mildly. Should it have been, though? Is it time to reassess? Maybe that was true. And if it is, kind of a big deal. Michael Flynn had his life destroyed, apparently because the FBI was monitoring him. Meanwhile, the FBI may have used the infamous Trump dossier to justify a FISA warrant against the Trump campaign. Obama administration officials unmasked Trump aides whose phone calls were then monitored. It looks an awful lot like the past administration deliberately spying on its political opponents. Isn't that what they got Nixon for? Dan Bongino is a former NYPD officer and Secret Service agent, and he joins us tonight. Um, Dan, there, it, the evidence is stacking up. I don't know how his wires tapped. I'm not exactly sure what the president meant by that. But it looks like people in his orbit working for his campaign were being surveilled by the administration. Why is that not a huge story? Um, Tucker, it should be. We're only looking at what I believe to be the biggest political scandal um, of our lifetime. Um, you know, chalk that up to hyperbole if you're a liberal out there who's frightened by those words. I don't care. I, I really, I, could ca I couldn't care any less about your opinion on this. We know some things for a fact right now. Yeah, was the use of the word wiretap maybe poorly worded, but Trump wasn't a federal agent. He's just using the word as people in normal, everyday conversation would use it. Was Trump surveilled, as you said? Tucker, no reasonable, sane person can question that. Was Trump surveilled by the Obama administration? No reasonable person can question that. Is there still no evidence of a predicate crime to surveil your opposition political presidential candidate who won the presidential election? We know that for a fact, too. And yet liberals seem to be whistling Dixie. They seem to have no problem with what, in my opinion, is an unbelievably blatant attack on the constitutional republic and an effort to overthrow a lawful election. So when you say we know, I just want to um, give one example that I think is kind of definitive, or clo close to definitive anyway. In the statement of offense that the independent counsel, Robert Mueller, put out about General Flynn, there is mentioned a number of times of phone calls between Flynn and transition officials, one of whom is described as a senior transition official, a, a Trump guy. And remember, this is before the inauguration, and the contents of those calls is described in some detail. Isn't that prima facie evidence of, uh, of surveillance? 
uh, only if you're not in a mental hospital. I mean, uh, Tucker, how do you think they got this information? Uh, well, ESP, yeah. extrasensory perception. I mean, they got this by applying for a FISA warrant, a FISA warrant to spy on Trump campaign officials under the guise of using what we would call reverse targeting. In other words, Tucker, let's pretend we're targeting a foreign agent as, as, as a, a predicate reason to really listen to an American citizen we're targeting in the first place, hence the term reverse targeting, which, by the way, Tucker, entirely defeats the purpose of the Bill of Rights. That's why libertarians and strong conservatives out there have always been skeptical about the monopolistic power of the government right now to surveil people without probable cause warrants. Yeah. And this FISA thing is a scam. It should concern everyone regardless of your political stripes. Then why do Republicans in Washington, because I'm going to disagree with you on that, Republicans in Washington have defended this since right after 9-11 and assured us that it stopped a lot of terror plots. They never provided evidence for that, but that we're not supposed to complain about it. It's unpatriotic to raise questions. Why have so many D.C. Republicans defended this so relentlessly for so long? Yeah, and just let me be clear, when I say FISA scam, I'm talking about the FISA warrant on Trump. The program has some merits, Tucker, in the targeting of overseas actors. They right. have no Bill of Rights, foreign, uh, of you know, for foreign actors and terrorists have no. That's I'm, I'm not suggesting. That. But I'm talking Americans, about specifically but with, Americans yeah. swept into this, or this program right. being used uh, as a pretext, basically, to spy on Americans. Why wouldn't that be of grave concern to everybody? Uh, because you have uh, uh, liberals right now and a far left activist group that is so infected with the Trump derangement syndrome virus that they're willing to literally forfeit away everything, including, Tucker, the potential in the future that they themselves could be the very same targets of the big government police tactics that are they're championing well, now in the effort right to attack Trump. That's it. And thank heaven we have Richard Goodstein. We're going to ask about that who's sitting on the set. Dan, thank you. It was great to see you. Yes, sir. As promised, Richard Goodstein is with us. He advised, of course, both of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaigns. He's been in D.C. a long time, long enough to remember, Richard, when liberals, That's Frank right. Church of Idaho, Senator, for example, really worried about the misuse of our spy agencies for domestic political purposes. Right. So, and I think they were spot on to worry about that because these things can be misused. It seems pretty clear that the Obama administration was spying on Trump people before the inauguration. Why, why wouldn't that worry every American, no matter what you think about Trump? Why does it not worry Donald Trump that the Russians, according to the intelligence community, tried to and indeed did kind of infiltrate and undermine our democracy by what they did? So that's the answer to the question, the discussion that no, you just that, had. It's not an answer. That's well, a bumper sticker. So no, let's no, get no, to no, the no. specifics. As Look, you agree. You've defended Robert Mueller. And I, I've been very slow to attack Mueller. And I'm going to cite him now. So in the statement of the charges against General Flynn, mm -hmm. he says that Flynn was on the phone with Kislyak, the Russian ambassador, and other foreign officials, and they were talking about what? They were saying, you know, we want to bring the U.S. closer to both Russia and Israel. Those are campaign promises right. that, that Trump made. Why is that an act of disloyalty against your country that would justify surveillance? I Do, don't understand. Does it surprise you that the U.S. government might surveil the Russian ambassador no, to the United doesn't. States? What's exactly. So you're assuming that this was a surveillance of Flynn, who incidentally we had already had a predicate for because the Russians had reached out. They didn't reach out to the Hillary Clinton campaign. They reached out to the Trump campaign, and the Trump response was, love it, let's Wait, see but I'm, more. I'm, I'm confused. That was to I'm undermine confused. the democracy. No, no, no. There, of course, the intel agencies are allowed to and ought to be surveilling foreign actors in the United States and also abroad. But we're supposed to be pretty jumpy about getting Americans involved in that surveillance. There's a high bar. The FISA court exists to make sure this is not abused. There's no evidence that Michael Flynn was doing anything wrong with the Russians at all. It doesn't show up in the Mueller statement. Yeah. Okay, And why wouldn't it? He's investigating that. There's no evidence he did anything right. untoward or disloyal to America, and they're still surveilling him. Why shouldn't that bother well, you? This was the same Michael Flynn sitting next to Vladimir Putin in 2015. That's not a crime, but the fact is to suggest that there's no evidence well, anywhere. Where's the evidence? Well, the fact is, is that Mueller next has. To Putin a crime? I, I bet you, if you put out Robert Mueller's desk drawer, there would be reams of evidence. He chose not but to put where it. Where is it? So it's secret evidence that no, the rest of not, us can't it's, see. It's not. A, we we will see it. But where is it? We, he's already pled guilty to a felony. 
felony. Exactly. So where's the evidence? And, and my guess is there would have been multiple felonies. Really? Because he's he would having have been to sell his, Look, I'm not. I don't know Mike Flynn. I'm not defending him on a personal basis. The guy's had to sell his house. His life has been destroyed. Yeah. He pled to a felony. He could go to jail. And yeah, still he should not... have thought about that before he lied but to the what federal did he government. Do? Okay, no, he lied. He lied. But he, and he was did under... other things as well. He... Really? Because where are they? Well, we, we know, for example, that he didn't disclose what he should have disclosed on forms that by law. But what did he law... do wrong? Well, Wait, no, I mean, like, that's well, like saying what did he... forms, no, but whatever. Hold on. It's not whatever. And yeah. I'm not excusing perjury. He pled to it. What I'm shocked by is that our intelligence agencies were surveilling the political opponent of the president at the time. Yeah. No, they were. I mean, it's it's right here. Yeah, they it, were, and nobody seems to care because you feel like someone you dislike is being hurt by it, so yeah. it's okay. And I would say the problem with that analysis is it suggests the FBI was out to get um, Donald Trump and his people, and the answer to that is Donald Trump should thank his lucky stars for the FBI. That's why he's president, because of what Comey did on July 5th and on right. October 28th. That is the okay. reason that he okay. is president. Sorry. Okay, but uh, that's an entirely separate debate. Well, but it's still and the I'm suggestion that the FBI is corrupted. Comey in this. Look, I'm just, let's just take, can we just take Trump and Hillary and all the polarizing political figures out of this and have an honest conversation? Sure. Isn't it something we should be concerned about when our intelligence and law enforcement agencies put Americans under surveillance and don't tell them about it and don't tell us why they're doing it and never come up with a, a real justification for it and then you see people's lives destroyed. How would you like this if this happened to a Democrat? You'd hate it. Yeah. And I hope that I would be honest enough to be on your side because yeah. it's wrong. I, I think the whole point of surveillance is not to sort of knock on the door of the guy being surveilled and saying, incidentally, watch yourself, what you say from now on. That's not the point. The point is to catch them doing things that are contrary to the interests of the United States. What, what, That's what Michael Flynn what, did. That's what Paul Really? Flynn what did what, what Flynn, okay, Flynn, if he did something that was, quote, contrary to the interests of the United States, yeah. he betrayed his country, which right. is what you just said. Yes. What is it? Okay. He and got his staff, when he was it? national security advisor, again, the president's national security advisor has pled guilty to a crime. While, so he, was lying security, to the FBI. while he was national security advisor, we know that he asked staff to basically take a client's wish list and put the United States seal on it and say, we want this to be well, U.S. Why policy. Isn't he, that is a problem. No, but you just accused him of disloyalty to his country. Yeah. Why hasn't he's been indicted? Why wasn't he indicted for that? Well, you have to ask Robert Mueller. No, no, I'm serious, but are you bothered? We don't have the answer because we're not Robert Mueller. I, 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 but aren't you bothered by it? I'm not aren't the you? least bit bothered that a prosecutor decides to go easy on something somebody who's a cooperating witness. If it offends people, so be it. But that's tried and true. That's what prosecutors do. But there's still, we haven't, he hasn't been shown to have done anything to hurt America. We've destroyed his life, and now we're nodding and saying it's okay that our intel agencies spy on Americans. Don't you see that, that our standards are, are getting really low? Well, again, Paul Manafort, I think we, we have reason to believe, was under surveillance for years, and I, I think that's what Donald Trump's really worried about, the conversations he had with Manafort I, you know, you may were be, picked you up. You may be right on Manafort, but it's just Flynn I'm obsessed with. I mean, yeah. he, he's a general. There's no evidence that he sold out America. I think asking the, right. you're, you're the government to put a stamp on your client's document, yeah, that's kind of selling out Well, they America. should have indicted him for it. Richard, thank you. My pleasure. We've got some words of advice for 2018, in case you're in the mood for advice as you nurse your post-New Year's hangover. Plus, we'll take a look at Baltimore, the city of, where the police have been shackled and there has been a predictable and very sad surge in murders. We'll break down the numbers. Stay tuned. Well, America didn't invade any countries last year, but one city still managed to become a war zone. Unfortunately, it was within our borders, Baltimore, Maryland. It ended the year with 343 murders, or 56 for every 100,000 people. That's the city's highest per capita rate ever, greater even than during the great crack epidemic, the sad epidemic of the 1980s. There's one obvious culprit for this, a stand down by police. After the 2015 riots there following the death of Freddie Gray, Baltimore cops were pressured to back off on tough policing tactics. A lot of them were afraid to go out and do what they did before. For the most part, they backed off, and this is the result. LaDawn Jones is a criminal defense attorney, and she joins us tonight. LaDawn, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me back, Tucker. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, so, look, th there are people in Baltimore who are, you know, not right-wingers who actually live there, in contrast to a lot of the leaders of Black Lives Matter, rich kids on college campuses, um, who are saying that the police leaving 
has been a tragedy. This is the Reverend Kinji Scott, an activist in the city. Quote, we wanted the police there. We wanted them engaged in the community. Why wouldn't people who live in a city with over 300 murders want police keeping order? Well, they absolutely do. No one never said that they didn't. They want the same thing that you talked about in your last few segments. They just don't want government overreach by having police officers who are abusive to innocent people um, right. and uh, abusing their power rather than performing their role as law enforcement. Well, I think, I mean, I think everybody wants that for sure. And I would, I agree with them completely. I hate any abuse of power, whether it's by the cops or the DMV worker you deal with or what any, anybody, abuse of power is always wrong. But that's not at all right. what the Black Lives Matter people in Baltimore were saying. I mean, it was the cops are the problem. The city's a bad place because of the cops. And then, of course, there were threats of violence against the police. So if you're a Baltimore police officer, why would you even bother to put your reputation or your life on the line to help people? Well, you know, I understand your argument. As a public servant, when you are, when you have a thankless job, it's very hard to get up the next day and do what you need to do. But that's what you sign up for. I don't think that the Black Lives Matter stands. And last time I was on your show, you list me as a Black Lives Matter activist. I'm not an activist, but I do understand their issue. They don't want government overreach by too much force by the police, and that's what they said. But that's not what people heard. People heard we don't want the police. When really they said we don't want the police to kill us, which is a pretty different thing. Right. So the whole like pigs in a blank get murder cop stuff that that was the nuanced message that you're describing well, I, I wouldn't think it is any more fair than to put all people who have this kind of negative and divisive connotation um, uh, as for the whole city of Baltimore or the, or the entire Black Lives Matter any, any more fair than it would be to say that every white person is with the Ku Klux Klan or a neo-Nazi. That's not the case, right? No, that was at a Black Lives Matter march. That was at a Black Lives Matter march. So, I mean, it's not, it's not like some out of nowhere connection that was at a march and it's on video so it's not like i'm making it up as you well know it in every movement, there are detractors. There are people who try to take away from the real change and be divisive. There are people who are misled. We've seen that in every single movement that there was. Black Lives Matter is no different. But anyone who really looks at what they stand for, what they put out, what their leaders expose, is really getting to the 21st century policing and making sure there's no government overreach with all of I mean, us. You keep using can that phrase. With. I mean, I, I doubt that you're against any kind of government overreach except this one. But. With that, Why let's would just you stick assume to, that? Let's just stick to this topic. 2017, 343 murders in the city of Baltimore. Why is that? Well, I don't live in Baltimore. I live in Atlanta. But I can tell you as a former prosecutor, there are a number of factors that go into the increase of, of criminal activity. But one of the number one things, the things that Black Lives Matter ask and many others, is that we want to make sure that the police are involved and an integral part of the community, not against the community. And they have wait, not reached wait, that I'm, point wait, yet. But, but hold on. I'm confused. So you say that you're part of Black Lives Matter, at least sympathetic to it. So it's in the name, Black Lives Matter. I, I don't know what percentage of those 243. Well, I didn't say that, but yeah. Okay. I don't know what percentage of those murder victims were African American, the overwhelming majority. So I'm a little concerned and confused by why you wouldn't have a better answer than there are a lot of reasons. Like, it's a serious question. Why were 343 people murdered in Baltimore this year? Have you thought about why? Absolutely, but I don't understand what one argument has to do with the other. There are a number of reasons why there were murders of black lives, and all black lives, all lives do in fact matter. And so whether they're taken by the hands of the police or of criminals, I think people who really care about their community want to address both of those. It doesn't have to be either or. Why? It doesn't because have black to be lives your matter spends a lot of, look, and I, uh, black lives matter spends all of its time talking about how the cops are the problem, but I don't hear anybody even thinking through, like, why is this happening? That's a lot of people to die in a small city, and I never hear anybody say why. Tucker, I have a hard time believing that you really have a whole lot of conversations with Black Lives Matter to know what they own. I'm having talk one, about. I'm having one right now, and I can't get a straight answer, well, no. which is a little bit revealing, Absolutely I would say. Absolutely not. Well, see, that's yeah, exactly okay. what I just told you when we came on. I'm not a Black Lives Matter activist, but I but do you, understand you thought why about the subject, force presumably. is an issue. Oh, but you haven't. I, okay. As all Americans, I would hope that you would have, too. All Americans should think about this issue. And, and we're actually saying the that's same thing, That's why I'm thing, doing the segment, because I, I, I want to I get a real answer. But I'm not getting one. And that's the We're answer. Done. What, what yeah. is the question? Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. 2017 was a toxic year in American political life. We have some advice on how to make the next year, this year, 2018, perhaps a little better. Next. Happy New Year.
here. America is still a great country, the best in the world, but it's also fragile. Wealth and power are concentrated in fewer hands than at any time in our history. And unfortunately, many of the people who wield it are short-sighted and unwise. Some of them actively dislike the country they lead. That doesn't mean disaster is coming, but it could. We have no idea what's going to happen in 2018. So it seems like a good moment to review the things we do know for sure. Here's a partial list of them. Wars almost never make countries richer or happier. Reading the internet all day does not make you smarter. Sending more texts and emails does not make you more productive. You have an absolute right to say what you think is true. Other people may not like your views, tough. Friendship is more important than politics. So are sports, dinner, church, dogs, and most hobbies. Attacking people because of their skin color is wrong. This is always true, no matter what the color is. The beginning of wisdom is understanding how little you can control. Gender is not a social construct. It is a biological reality. Men and women are inherently different. They are not interchangeable. Pretending otherwise isn't just absurd and anti-science. It's also a surefire way to make healthy relationships impossible. Families fail and a society collapse. Animals are closer to humans than we think, and people are closer to animals. No matter how many public safety agencies government bureaucrats invent, when it comes down to it, you're responsible for yourself and your family. Best to know that ahead of time. The only immutable law is the law of unintended consequences. New and improved electronic devices rarely improve your life. Often they enslave you. No text message or social media post is ever worth interrupting a meal with people you love. The U.S. government has one duty, securing the well-being of American citizens. Relatively few people who work for the government actually believe that. Charity begins at home. Before you send a check to fight malaria in Congo or sponsor a Syrian refugee to come to Minneapolis, ask yourself why so many of our fellow Americans are living on the street or dying of drug overdoses, and then ask what you can do to help. Laws change, customs and beliefs change, a lot changes. Human nature does not change. Any food that makes your mouth water, likely bad for you. In the end, all that really counts is relationships with other people. No matter how successful you are, if your kids hate you, you have failed. History happened, whether you like it or not. And finally, you want to make the world better? Raise decent children, preferably a lot of them. Well, after ending the 2016 year by decrying fake news, the press in America kept publishing false stories all through 2017. Up next, we'll discuss how they can get back on track in this new year, assuming they want to. Stay tuned. It's a new year, but not everyone is making resolutions. You're probably pledging to swear off dessert. I am, or join a gym. But virtually nobody in the press corps here in Washington is planning on changing a thing. And that's odd, considering how embarrassing 2017's news coverage actually was. It was about a year ago that the Washington Post was reporting, you'll remember, that Russia had breached the American electrical grid. Panic ensued. That story turned out to be totally false. So were countless claims that were repeated in virtually every press outlet that the Russian government hacked our election. That suggested that Putin rigged it or even altered vote totals somehow. There was never any evidence of that, and there still isn't. But they're still saying it. And how about that story about how Mike Flynn was going to testify that Trump had ordered to him to make contact with Russia just before the election? Remember that one? ABC ran it, then retracted it, but not before causing big short-term losses in the stock market. Oops. That very same week, CNN ran a made-up story about Donald Trump Jr. and WikiLeaks. Remember that one? Wrong again, but they kept going. We could go on and on and on. There are a lot of examples. Donald Trump loathes the media, of course. Knight even tweeted this, quote, I will be announcing the most dishonest and corrupt media awards of the year. On Monday at 5 o'clock, subjects will cover dishonesty and bad reporting in various categories from the fake news media. Stay tuned. So he doesn't like the media. But does that give reporters license to be sloppy and dishonest? Joe Concha writes about the press for The Hill, and he joins us tonight. So, Joe, there, I mean, we could go through, as we often do, all the examples of the press getting it wrong uh, or putting a thumb on the scale. 
But I want to take three steps back because it's a new year and ask, what is this about? It seems like news outlets are devaluing their own currency, which is credibility, in pursuit of Trump. It's hurting them, but they're still doing it. Why? They're doing it because for many networks and papers like the Washington Post and New York Times, most read years ever in terms of subscriptions, digital subscriptions up, uh, CNN, MSNBC, most watched years for them ever. The, granted, CNN still in third place, MSNBC still, still, uh, uh, still in second, Fox News in first. So it's been very good for business. Uh, I also think that if you abandon all neutrality, Tucker, that you actually get a gold star and possibly a promotion and an award. And let me give you one example, and this is a very clear one. Jorge Ramos was, uh, he's an advocate who plays an anchor on TV. He was awarded the prestigious Walter Cronkite Award. And here's what he said, and I'm quoting, neutrality is not an option when covering Donald Trump. Judgment day is coming for those who stay silent on Trump. That sounds like somebody who's leading a resistance, and he's given the biggest, most prestigious award in journalism for saying that you shouldn't be objective anymore when covering a sitting president. Judgment day is coming. That, that suggests a, a spiritual element to this. That sounds like a something from a sermon. It does, doesn't it? I'll give you another sermon, by the way. Bob Woodward said on CNN on Sunday, and this, is, this, this sums it up perfectly. In lots of reporting, particularly on television commentary, there's a self-righteousness, smugness, and people kind of ridiculing the president. When we reported on Nixon, it was obviously a very different era, but we did not adopt a tone of ridicule. The tone was, what are the facts? Bob Woodward gets it. They pursued facts without actually ridiculing, and that's... That's the way we should be going about our business now. But in 2018, Tucker, that ain't going to change. It seems like, and look, I, I'll just stipulate what is obvious, which is the president goads the press. He doesn't like them, and he's always tweeting about them. But I wonder why nobody in the press corps has decided, you know, I'm not going to rise to the bait, and I'm just going to play it as straight as I possibly can and let my stories speak for themselves. They seem personally offended. Oh, yeah, there, there's definitely uh, a... a, a how can I put this? When, when the president criticizes members of the press, they take it personally. And, and my wife's an ER doctor. I'll give you an example around this. She has people that come in to the emergency room all the time, and lots are drug seekers, and they're faking illnesses in order to get a prescription. And when they don't get what they want, they personally start to attack her verbally. And she just puts her head down, she ignores all the criticism, and she does her job. And that's what reporters should be doing. They should ignore what the president's saying in terms of fake news and the tweets that come out every day because he knows it's a political play because his base thinks that the media actually is the opposition party. Right. So, yeah, they, they need to do that. But instead, what they end up doing is they take unnamed sourced information that's weaponized from people that are purposely pushing false narratives and they run with it because they feel that's ammunition and they don't care if they get it wrong because there's never any accountability for the most part so, when so they do get it wrong. So here's the very quick 10 seconds. They yeah. told us for a year that the Trump campaign colluded with the Putin government to steal the election. If it turns out not to be true, where does that leave them? It leaves them with half of their audience believing that it still is true, and they'll just right. continue to they'll find another narrative to push as long as it's negative towards the administration. Boy, that divides the country right there. Joe Concha, thanks a lot. For Happy 2018. Happy 2018. We'll be right back. That is about it. Like sands through an hourglass, another hour has passed unaccountably. It is great to be back. Thanks for joining us tonight. Tune in every night at 8 p.m. to the show Eastern. It is the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and group. Think DVR it if you know how that works. Good night from Washington. Sean Hannity is next. Take it away, Sean. All right.